Today's Stillmace Warrior partner is Set for Set. We want to take the time to thank them for the offer that we provided during this episode and for teaming up with the podcast to provide a better listening experience for you. You can find out more about Set for Set at stillmacewarrior.com or by visiting their official website at setforset.com. All right, guys, Still Mace with Warrior here. And today we have Don from Adix, Adix Clubs and Maces. And you can tell by his shirt, he wanted to sport the shirt. <laughs> and Rocking I, the shirt. Yeah, and I'm so excited. Uh, we're going to ask him a little bit about, you know, his story, uh, a little bit about his company. And, uh, and obviously he's doing workshops too, so we're going to ask him some questions about Steel Mace, of course. So, John, let's start off by, by just – I want to thank you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. You know, I, I love that so far everyone in the community has been super awesome. Everyone's been telling me, yeah, let's do it. So thank you for your time. I know you're, you're probably a busy guy. Um, and so let's just kind of go into your background. Tell people a little bit about Don before you started the company, before you got to the Still Mace, and like what got you to the Still Mace. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me on the show, first off, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, my background, uh, I went back and forth most of my life between construction of one form or another and uh, the restaurant business. I've actually had 27 years in the restaurant business. I've done everything from wash dishes to owning two of them, uh, not at the same time, two different times. Uh, one was a failure. One was uh, a, a monstrous success. Uh, I left the restaurant business when I had gotten divorced back in 1998. Uh, and um, I've been in fitness my whole life. Well, not my whole life, since I was 12 years old. And wow. I began with the, um, you know, the plastic coated concrete weight set. Um, I, I think I had gotten one for Christmas one year. I asked my dad for one. And mm. I started training in the basement as best as I could. And then uh, after a couple of years of that, now this was in the middle 70s, after a couple of years of that, uh, Muscle and Fitness uh, magazine started showing up everywhere. Right. And all of a sudden it was really mainstream and people knew who uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno were from being on TV and the different movies and shows they were. And it was fitness was becoming more and more of a topic at the dinner table. Um, as I grew older, I found that I, I trained specifically for um, powerlifting. I started out with the, you know, the bodybuilder mentality, and I was a big wrestling fan, you know, with the WWF, which turned to the WWE, you know, with the Hulk Hogan days and the glory days of that, of that uh, entertainment. So seeing these people and, you know, wanting to be you know, bigger and stronger to play football or just to be, you know, you're bigger and let's face it, you're, you're bigger and stronger looking, or if you look like you're in shape, people are less apt to mess with you. Right. So, you know, I grew up on a, on a border between Connecticut and New York. I actually lived two streets into Connecticut and I was close enough to Manhattan where I grew up that it was like about a 25 to 30 minute express train ride from where our train station to downtown Manhattan. So, that that was kind of I grew up in an, a very diverse area, which you know was great for uh, character molding, and um, everybody was in getting into fitness at that time. So it was kind of like a great start, you know, to my life to being a young man. Right. Uh, my dad, my dad was an avid baseball player. He played baseball and softball two nights a week up until he was fifty five years old. Wow. Um, he was, he played on his high, high school basketball team at only five foot nine and he played and was a starter. So he was a good athlete and he instilled a lot of sports in me and my brothers and sisters. Um, you know, we got kind of, we didn't grow up uh, very wealthy or privileged in any way. You know, we were working class family and grew up in a working class neighborhood, but, uh, it was a lot of fun. And that led, as I got older, you know, I got, I got more in, in interested in powerlifting to get bigger and stronger. And I have a brother that's within 20 months of our, I think we're maybe 22 months apart. So we're, we kind of grew up together and we were friends, had the same friends and we were competitive with each other. Uh, he's a lot stronger than I am. So I always had to train harder than him. He was, he's one of those guys that just walks past the gym and he gets huge right. and I got to go there for six years. So, you know, he just looks at the weight pile and he's like, bam, 
I'm strong. Yeah. Um, got in, I pretty much worked, um, like I said, restaurants and construction my whole life. Um, didn't really have any college to speak of. Um, did not attend college. I did attend a massage therapy school in the 90s because I wanted to, I figured that was the quickest entry level with a title to get into the fitness business that I could put LMT after it, you know, I was a licensed massage therapist. Right. And then that could broaden everything, you know, with getting a fitness certificate. But it never really panned out back in the 90s because I was doing very well with one of my restaurants. Um, Got it. You know, so after the divorce and going through the um, all of that stuff, uh, I started changing directions in life, got more into the construction, um, wanted a little more adventure in life. So I decided I was going to become a crane operator because I thought that'd be an exciting job and it's hard work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I really enjoyed it. I did that for about 10 years uh, for two different companies. Um, it was a lot of fun. Got got a lot of uh, crash course experience and this is where a lot of people don't realize but in their life where their fitness pays off I mean most people don't have physical jobs like we used to right. and um, a lot of my uh, of the training that I did you know it, it kept me strong throughout my life and I was I was kind of you know like not into fitness as good as I should be, like the whole complete lifestyle, but I always exercised in one way or another. And, um, you know, I would have to climb the tower cranes and not climb as in a ladder climb, you know, getting up to operate it. I used to do the setups on them also. So not only was an, I was an operator, I was also a driver and a tech for the com company. So I'd have to climb up the tower cranes and not use the normal way of climbing, maybe on the outside of them. And, you know, staying fit would kept me able to do that while, while I was in my 40s. And that's when I changed career directions. I think at 39, I changed career directions to get into, uh, to get into the construction uh, more, more so. And then work my way into being a crane operator so that that was kind of a, a payoff for you know the way fitness helped me uh change careers actually if I wasn't fit and I wasn't able to climb those cranes I wouldn't have gotten a chance to make the money that I did in that field I would have been you know just set away you know to doing one thing and that was it right. I wouldn't be able to be so an asset to the company um so that, in a way, it paid off. I had gotten laid off from that company, and I was hired at 48 years old to be a cell phone tower climber, believe it or not. Wow. And the next, the next youngest guy down from me was 31 years old. So that was the age gap. They said, they said that most people after 40 just don't do that anymore because of the physicality of it. Um, you know, sometimes it takes you 10 minutes to get to the top of the tower. Right. And you're carrying tools and gear, and then you have to hoist things up. So it was a very physical job. I was also a crane operator for that company, so I, I really enjoyed the days. I had a nice, beautiful crane that was brand new that I um, that I worked with them, so that was kind of cool. Um, long story short, I'm, I abandoned the weightlifting uh, in... 2012 2013 in favor of just training with clubs and then adding maces to it i had mm. injured myself um back in the 90s when i owned one of my restaurants that i was talking about uh i, I injured my shoulder i didn't know the severity of the injury at the time it was trying to go for a bench press contest i was trying to attain a 400 pound bench and i was training wow. my way up to that I, I used to be a lot bigger than what I look. I used to be 248 pounds at one time, and I only had a 34-inch waist at that weight. So I was kind of, I was kind of jacked. So yeah, yeah. It, you know, it was, it was, it was a nice time, but it was, you know, 8,000 calories a day of force feeding too. So I got away wow. from that um, in 2012, 2013, and decided to train only with clubs. Um, I. From from the time that I got injured in the 90s, where I had a sprained um, uh, acromioclavicular joint, that's where your 
collarbone touches your shoulder blade. There's a ligament between the two bones. It creates the glenoid fossa, which is a little cup that your humerus or the bone under your bicep sits in like this. Well, that joint spread like this, if you can imagine. And oh, the wow. ligament between the two bones stretched out. So I had a severe sprain in there. And I also tore my pec muscle from my sternum, my upper pec from my sternum. I didn't know about that until years later when I lost weight. But the but anyway, that's a different story. Yeah. But the, the doctors all told me, I went to three different doctors, and they told me, two of them told me we could put a screw in there and tighten it up so you won't have any problems of your tendon and your nerve getting jammed between that joint, which it would do constantly, especially when one of my restaurants was a pizzeria and I'm doing this all day. Yeah. And it was a very, very busy place. Um, and I had another doctor that told me, well, you might be able to do, you know, do something with therapy, but I don't think it'll work. So that was the, you know, the consensus of everything. That was, you know, the prognosis the doctors gave me, you know, put a screw in it and that's it, you know, yeah. be done with it. Um, in 2007, I kind of got tired of being sick and tired of my shoulder hurting for the past uh, 14 years or 13 years. And uh, I looked online and I, I typed in alternative shoulder exercises. And I came up with this very famous club swinger and he manufactures his own clubs. I came up with a video of him on his website and he's swinging the club in the mill. If people know what the mill is, it's the motion that I'm doing like this. And it's kind of very common. You see with the, with the club trainees that they do that motion. It's almost like you're throwing a ball repeatedly and constantly throwing. And I said, that's the exercise I want to be able to do because at the time I wasn't able to get in the bottom part of a plank of a push the push up plank to start off with. I couldn't get into that position because my shoulder hurt that much. That's how much pain I had. Um, I didn't want to opt for, you know, any type of, uh, drug therapy. I didn't, I didn't believe in that. I, yeah. I did take a lot of Tylenol, uh, 222s, which I would pay people that returned. I'm in Florida. So I, a lot of people from the Bahamas and South America and Canada would come to visit and I would give my friends money to go and buy them and get those really strong Tylenols that I'd be taking all day long and washing down with espresso. And then I realized this is not a good way to live. Right. And, and I really set out on a journey to find, um, you know, a different way to train so that I could be more physical because at, at some, some days I couldn't even jog because the, the jarring up and down at every step that I took, like made the shoulder vibrate and that right. would irritate my shoulder. So I came across the guy that I mentioned before swinging the club and, and I said, that's the thing I got to do. So, so what, so up. what, what made you like decide that? Like, cause I mean, obviously someone with a shoulder injury would probably see that and say, Oh, that's going to like mess me up more. Like what, what's so special about the clubs? Like how is it therapeutic? Yeah, oh, well, the, the initial, my initial response was, I'm a really firm believer in that you got to trust your body and trust yourself. And because we live in a modern society and we're told so much stuff, we ignore what our bodies are telling us. Yeah. And when I saw that video and like I, I had attended massage therapy school. So every day for six months, I had gotten a massage at this school and gave a massage. So it was always a trade at the end of the day. You, you ever walk by like in a mall where they have those massage chairs and somebody's getting a massage right? and you look, and you look sometimes and you go, wow, that looks like it feels so good, you know, and your body just relaxes looking at it. Yeah. When I saw this guy swinging this club, that's what my, I did. I totally relaxed. I watched it. I was watching it on a, on an old laptop when it was big, heavy iBooks or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. And it was like this at the dining room table, like bored looking in the computer and I'm watching the video. And all of a sudden I noticed my reflection in the screen was slinking down. I was like slumping down and I was yeah. melting like a pat of butter. And I said, <laughs> and this, and this guy was going on for like three minutes of doing this swing. And I'm like, that's the thing I need to do. My body's just relaxing, imagining that, you know, the, you know, the mind body connection. I was there like tuning into how he was feeling. So I said, let me give this a try. So I took a baseball bat, had an aluminum bat, little T-ball bat that I keep around the house. And I started trying to learn how to do the pattern and I got it down pat and I started swinging it and there was no 
there was no tractioning effect. He, I had read his, his um, you know, everything on his website, and they talk about that when, you, when you're working with the clubs or the maces and you're swinging it, it opens up your joints when you're at the end of your range because you have this ballistic force pulling out and creating a traction mm. as you're moving. So I wasn't getting any of the traction with this, you know, 14 ounce baseball bat. That's like basically a five year old's T-ball bat. Right. So I said, maybe I should try a very lightweight dumbbell. And I had dumbbells that you could load up, you know, have the bolt on the end. And I put a three pound weight on the one that had the small shoulder on it. And I just put a little three pounder and I swung this clunky little handle for three months. Every night I did a hundred repetitions on each arm. And at the end of the three months, I got down on the floor and noticed I could knock off 10 push-ups like I never missed a day, you know, like I never was injured. There was no wow. pain in my shoulder. I was waking up every day, you know, and I just kind of said, let me do the time to be able to, you know, like put the exercise in and see how it goes. Don't test it during that three months time. Just do the exercise and see what happens. And I got on the floor and I just nailed out these 10 push-ups. And it was the first time I had done push-ups and, you know, successfully and without pain in, you know, 13 years. Wow. Because I had gotten hurt and I had gotten hurt in 94. So that's how long I was living without living with serious fitness. I, I always, you know, monitored my diet, not really watched it well. I, you know, I learned a lot since being um, immersed in the fitness field you know, by talking with other people and paying attention to it more because this is now my, now my business and my livelihood. It's not just a hobby anymore, right. but I realized that this should be more than a hobby for all of us because fitness is maintaining ourselves. Yes. And, and, and a lot of people aren't into that and I'm trying to get that out to them. And it's, especially people who don't want to go the traditional route. And I found that I'm maintaining my body composition. You know, I, I, I weigh somewhere between 170 and 200 pounds throughout the year. I go up and down. I fluctuate depending upon my training. And uh, yes, I am a lot stronger at 200 pounds than 170 pounds, 170 pounds. I'm ripped and I feel great on the beach, you know? So, yeah. you know, there's a give and take there, but, um, I, I find I can do it a lot easier now that, you know, with, with being, you know, like a little sharper with the diet and with the advent of social media where people are sharing a lot of things and you can find people with similar body compositions and stuff. So with the social media, it makes it a lot simpler to be fit these days. Yeah. And, and, um, anyway, to get, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but, um, <laughs> to get, to get back to like addicts and how it developed, I, I yeah. realized, I said, wow, this is, you know, just something that is, you know, everybody should have people. There are a lot of shoulder injuries. I noticed um, when Facebook started around 2009 and, or 2008, I started seeing all my friends that I went to high school with and they were getting shoulder surgeries, knee replacements, hip mm -hmm. replacements, um, all of these things. And I was like, wow, you know, like people need, you know, to take care of themselves better. And these are guys and girls, you know, that worked out, you know, they weren't really sedentary people. A lot of the sedentary people have these issues, but now I was noticing it with the people that were athletes in high school or who maintained their um, physical training as they got older. So I was starting to see that there's, you know, we might be training a, a little bit. We've gotten a little bit better as far as our training, you know, like the programming and the actual functional fitness actually translating to life rather than, you know, lifting weights and just being a bodybuilder or a power exactly. lifter. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. that's what it was before. And now we're realizing that, you know, and then I'm plugging it all in in my head and I'm going, well, I stayed, you know, I did my training and I was able to do, you know, these jobs that guys my age weren't getting hired for. And, you know, I said, there's something to, you know, the, the fitness thing, you know, more than what I, as I saw before, I always knew there was something, but I didn't realize it, you know, the worth of it right. until I was getting hired because of it. And I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, this is really, um, something and something that people need to maintain too. You know, when I had that revelation, I was like, 
or the realization, I was like, this is really cool. How do I get this out to more people? Exactly. And I said, you know, so my, when I had done the clubs, uh, I, I was interested in purchasing some of the clubs from this guy. Um, he, uh, his clubs are really high end. They're expensive. And at the time I was paying a, an enormous amount of child support and I never had a problem with that. And, and, you know, it was always, but it, it never left me with a lot of money, a lot of spending money. It always, I always had a tight budget in my household, you know, and it's understandable because it's my kids, right? but I couldn't afford his clubs. And I said, well, maybe I can make one. I've got some welding experience, some metal fabrication experience that I've gained throughout my life. And I said, let me cut apart one of these baseball bats and stuff some weights into it and see what happens. So my first clubs um, on my Facebook page, you could see a lot of, I, I'll post every once in a while, the pictures of the first clubs that I made, the actual picture of the dumbbell, the one-sided dumbbell. And then the bats I made into clubs that I trained with, with regular weights sandwiched into them. And then I came up with in 2010, the actual drawing, the concept for the Adex club that I'm selling now. Um, it's been refined a little bit since then, you know, as production yeah. goes on. Um, but, uh, I came up with the idea and in 2012, I decided that I was going to go forward with this. And the reason that it happened to me that I wanted to, to do this and to be more involved with it and to open a business again was because I had gotten arrested in 2011 and, uh, it was for a DUI. Uh, mm -hmm. I was found innocent of the charges two years later, but I was also fired from the cell phone tower job, which I was also a crane operator at, because they had taken my CDL license from me. The government, oh, uh, you, know, the, right. the, you know, the DOT wouldn't grant me, um, you know, uh, the, my DOT license. They, wouldn't, uh, they were giving me a very hard time. Yeah. Um, so I never wanted to be in that position again. I said, I have to take charge of my own destiny again. My, my fate was in other people's hands. I didn't like that. And um, so I said, I have to start working on this club idea. You know, this could be a business and this could help people. And mm -hmm. that's where, you know, like I started plugging everything together. I, I started coming up with the concept for the adjustable club based on the bats that I made. And then from there, I started, you know, um, contacting metal suppliers and machine shops. I did the drawings myself. I, I have, I took, um, drafting and architecture throughout junior high school and high school as one of my shop classes. So I knew how to draw the drawings and I still have some of my tools. That's a, don't ever get rid of your school tools. <laughs> we'll need them in life. You, uh, you know, so it was like 35 years later, I'm using them, you know, I'm blowing the dust off. I'm pulling them out and I'm using them. But, um, you know, I, I drew my drawings. I brought them to uh, a machine shop and I had them make a prototype. And then I brought that to a production machine shop to get them made. And uh, from there, I said, well, let me make a batch of 50 and try to sell them on Facebook. Now, I'm going to be 55 years old. So, like, the computer world is really new to me. Um, I did do work in a, I, I was a, a columnist for a magazine for a while, which I used to do as a job. And uh, I, I created advertisements. So the, this was back in like 2000, I, I, you know, 2000, 2000 to 2003, I did that. And I gained all my computer knowledge then, but I wasn't really tech savvy as, you know, like somebody that could market. So right. I started talking to people in the fitness industry. I started friending people who were in, in, in the fitness world and that's what led me to come across guys like rick brown mr mace man and um and david glisten and jason tackett from mississippi uh jake shannon and you know even more recently guys like leo yukides and matt burberry you know all these people that are that are um in the fitness world and dealing with clubs and maces and that type of training, the kettlebell people I got involved with, with Valerie Pulowski and Jessica Huttig and um, um, Yuri uh, Petronovs from the uh, American Kettlebell Alliance and uh, 
we started doing things together. I started working with that organization also because it's, uh, it seems that the kettlebell people gravitate towards the club and the mace training. Right. Yeah. And, and, and actually we had, uh, for listeners, we had a little conversation, me and Don, the yesterday beforehand, and we were talking about that. We were talking about how a lot of uh, people who are on into kettlebells get into maces and clubs and those who get into mace, they, they like the kettlebell. And you were mentioning that it's because of the ballistic factor um, going oh, yeah, on there. Yeah. Yeah. They understand the, the ballistics. Um, Power lifters and strongmen, they understand the ballistics, uh, Olympic lifters, because they're uh, – Olympic lifters are probably the um, most conventional of the sport people, you know, of the weightlifters that understand ballistics. If you look at the dynamics of a, of a clean or a snatch and the way they have to hurl the mm -hmm. weight explosively from the floor, they understand that – they kind of like are the first weightlifter type people to say, oh, let me incorporate kettlebells or clubs or maces in my training because they understand that power lifters and bodybuilders usually come along to it when after an injury, especially a shoulder, an upper back or a pec injury, and they're trying to rehab or sometimes the bodybuilders will use the clubs or the maces to like um, shred up for a competition or after a heavy training session that they do, they'll do it to uh, flush fresh blood into their into the muscles and joints that they were that they just trained. Power lifters do it to get the, you know to open their chest back up again, you know, from the medial rotation of you know pressing up a heavy weight and drawing it in. You know, a lot of people get that tightness in their chest and they have to open it back up. Right. So you know the. the the bodybuilders and powerlifters, they understand it, but not to the degree of the, that the weightlifters do. And uh, it's slowly catching on with people as far as a, uh, a restorative type of training rather than a strength type of training. I do, I do it for both directions. I use it for to maintain, and I'm actually building strength with it now. I've been documenting as I'm going along for the years that I'm actually progressing in weight as I'm getting older and I'm getting close to my golden years. That's you know? awesome. And, well, I'm trying to build that suit of armor to go into my later years, you know, able to, you know, fall down and be able to take a fall, not shatter like an egg. And, you know, like so many people are, you know, that society in society today, you know, older people are, are, you know, just falling and they, and some die on the floor three, four days later from an injury because nobody found them yeah. and they're not able to get up. So, you know, that with, in that aspect, I'm trying to foster that, you know, that's, that's my predominant market is to go for people who are, uh, you know, a master's age, you know, 35, 40 years old, who've already been you know, into sports and, and maybe have gotten injured or want to get back into it or have never done that type of stuff and are looking for a different modality to train in. So, you know, for that, you know, I'm trying to set, you know, what I'm doing with myself as kind of like a, a test to see how am I, am I maintaining muscle mass by training this way? Am I in maintaining my strength and I do periodization training throughout the year to achieve that and it seems so far so good I'm actually you know climbing in the strength not as fast as weightlifting does but you know as far as like the average person I'm moving and I'm able to do more than the regular person that's out there that's not taking care of themselves that's really awesome and I mean do you plan to share that Oh yeah. When I, you know, like I'm compiling all this information, uh, hopefully, you know, like that, that's, um, you know, there, there's, um, uh, uh, Tyler Valencia from Kips yeah. is starting to initiate the studies already with, you know, what Mace training is doing and, you know, trying to get validation on that. He's got some people that are working like kinesiologists and exercise people, you know, that, that actually have degrees in that area that he's working with to um, see how, you know, the mace and the club training is going to, you know, actually works and they're going to do studies with that. So that's going to be kind of exciting to see. That'll probably take a few years to do yeah. also. Um, I'm just going to compile my information as here's what I did 
and you know it could work for you type of thing i'm not going to tell people that it is going to work for them i'm not going to tell right. people that it is a magic bullet to re you know to restore their shoulder but it it works it does yeah. you know and it, it's it's you know it's going to help a lot of people it's not going to help every person but it's going to help a lot so right. you know that's that's where i'm looking now yeah and like we've been mentioning clubs a lot but what mm -hmm. did you do? Because it seems like you're, you, the first thing you did was clubs, right? How did you yes, get that's to, correct. Uh, how did you get to the steel mace and how did you get the idea of making this adjustable steel mace? Um, you know, obviously there's a connection there. You want to like talk a little bit about that? Sure. That, that came after I, I was talking with Rick Brown, Mr. Mace Man. And um, Rick said, wow, you know, if somebody had a, a, you know, like a really good adjustable mace, you know, that'd be a good idea. And I was thinking about it, but I, I needed someone that had a little bit of more credibility than just myself of making a product. I mean, my clubs were already starting to catch on a little bit as best as I could market them. You know, they, they were going and they were selling. And, um, I said, well, what if I made a, you know, just a longer handle on my club? And I, and then I started thinking, you know, maybe people wouldn't like that because of the shape of it, you know, being the long head on it rather than, you know, the traditional cannonball stuck on a pole type of thing. Right. And um, then I started looking through, um, you know, the traditional wooden ones that were in uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, you know, what the guys were training with over there. The, the goddas, I, right? The, the goddas, the meals, the, the, the smaller clubs that they used. And I was like, you know, the shape of those. And then I was looking at the ones that were brought to the Western world. And I was like, you know, the shape of those, why not? You know, like yeah. there's, no, there's no set shape. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens if I make one. So I made one and I sent it to Rick. And I said, wear the paint off of this thing and then send it back to me. I said, just train with it as much as you can. That's and I made awesome. him a 30-pounder, and he came back with a few suggestions, and I worked on it, you know, and I, I implemented the suggestions that he said. And at the same time, while all this was going on, I think I sent that to Rick in September of 2015. At the same time this was going on, the AKA Kettlebell League – had their first mace competition, and I believe it was at, it was at Noskov Fitness in New, northern New Jersey. And um, I, I saw this on social media, and I was like, holy crow. But you know what? The, the Adex mace, you know, the idea I came up with, you know, being adjustable, I was like, this, this would save them a lot of problems of bringing, you know, like they had three platforms just like a kettlebell set up you know kettlebell competition right and they had the flights going on and they had a few flights you know with men and women involved in it and i was realizing that they had to bring you know x amount of maces per platform to accommodate the different athletes that right. were there so mm -hmm. i called yuri and i'm like listen if you're running these competitions i've got an adjustable mace you only need one per and maybe one extra one for, you know, a warm up area. And he was like, send him to me. Right and then on. I sent him to him to try it out, try it out to see how he liked it. And he placed an order for nine more. Wow. For his gym at Wilton sport and fitness in Connecticut. So he liked that idea. And um, then he asked me to write the rules for the vintage strength, uh, games, you know, I, him and Valerie Pulowski were, um, well, Val was kind of leading up the, the vintage strength games as she still is. And, uh, Yuri's like overall the whole, the whole organization and Val's kind of like in the vintage strength games thing. So she said, write up the rules for it. So I did. And, you know, as best as I could to understand what they were looking for. And, um, it's a really interesting competition. It's a 10 to two competition that they do with the maces. You're judged on every swing. So every swing you do is, is being watched and counted by somebody, by a judge, just like in kettlebell lifting. The mm -hmm. flights are five minutes long instead of 10 minutes long, which makes it very exciting because now the, now the spectators want to watch that, you know, I mean, kettlebell right. sport is fantastic and everything, but, to watch somebody do the same thing for 10 minutes is kind of, you know, like it gets tight in and it, yeah. it kind of isn't enjoyable for the audience. 
but I believe the five minute time slot, it's just enough time to keep them from getting bored. And there's enough time for them to really sprint near the end. So you see people maintaining this cruising level. And then in the last, you know, minute you see them going like you know bursts of this all out and it's it's yeah. kind of crazy yeah, yeah. so it's 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 uh it's an endurance with a sprint in it so if anybody's interested in getting involved in that uh, it's so awesome to be on that platform too yeah it yeah. really is and now you're, you know? you're so you're the one who wrote all the rules what what type of rules are there with that i mean for someone who actually wants to get into competition okay well just to begin with, the mace must start on the ground. It's got to be touching the ground, you know, in some way or other, whether it's standing on the, the ADEX maces have pommels on the end of them so that they're not, it's just not a straight handle coming down. Mm -hmm. I, I put a knob at the end of them to make it a little safer for the competition. I actually designed the mace kind of with the competition in mind. Oh, the handles are a little, the handles are a little thinner. So your wrists don't get as fatigued, your forearms, don't get as fatigued as holding a fatter grip mace and it's it, it enables a faster swing and people mm -hmm. can articulate their hands better when it when they're holding on to something thinner think about if you're moving like this or if your hand is like this and you're trying to articulate it's clunky but when your hands like this you can whip it around so the right. tighter your hand is you know it's a little easier for people to move um the mace has to start on the touching on the ground uh, people have come up, I think there's three styles of launches that people have come up with, the athletes have come up with. So we see this progression and how the athletes are actually adapting to it and what they're doing for their competition, which is really freaking cool. Yeah. Because there's not, I teach a certain way of a launch. Rick teaches another way of a launch because Rick teaches competition mace also. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Val has a different launch than that, and uh, her and Jessica launched the same. So they, it, it's really cool to see the different personalities come out in it, as long as yeah. it follows the rule of it touching, you know, it has to start on the floor. Um, there's a, you can switch hands one time. So if you have a right hand on top, you could switch over to the left. You can rest as long as the mace doesn't touch the floor. So you, you have to shoulder park it. You have to lean it against your shoulder. And you can rest and breathe, and you can rest as many times as you want. You know, that's up to you as long as the mace just doesn't touch the floor. Yeah. Um, you're counted off of the last complete rep that you did. So if you rested on a half rep, you got to do that other half rep to start it over again to make it a continuous rep, or you did like an extra half rep that's not going to be counted. Right. So you, have to, so you have to start where you left off. Mm -hmm. um, to do the continual rep and the hands must come down in the front lower than the navel i think we're going to change that somehow where we're going to be doing something because we've had a lot of um you know problems with that you know where people are saying well here's my belly button and you can't see it because my shirt is on because some uh, people do have higher navels yeah. it was originally it was originally to like the solar plexus area like you know the bottom of the sternum right. and we didn't feel that the hands were coming down deep enough it was leaving for a really sloppy swing with a lot of people mm -hmm. so they weren't hitting and also too that the 10 and 2 that they're doing has got to be between the 10 and 2 angles and not way down at the you know the nine to three or way up high at the you know eleven and one, it's got to be really like a forty five degree angle off the shoulder to emulate that ten and two on the on the hands of the clock. That's right. where that came from, the ten to two, and that might disappear because there's not many analog clocks left in the world. Kids don't know how to tell time. <laughs> we still have <laughs> not an them. analog. Yeah, that's going to be like a secret code one day if you use one of them. Huh. And, and uh, so that that's where the ruling came from that. And it, it's gaining a lot of popularity. Um, people are coming out and they're, they're developing, um, you know, people's personalities are coming out with it. They're, they're getting nicknames. Um, uh, Jess Huddig is known as the Viking Princess and Valerie Pulowski is known as Miss uh, uh, Lady Gaga, like, like a play on Lady Gaga. Oh, that's and, so cool. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's, you know, they, and Love that. people are, people are developing this and um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. And I think the biggest accomplishment for the MACE competitions is that Yuri held them at the Olympia when they are at the Mr. Olympia in, 
was that in the, in the fall of September or the end of August or the beginning of September every year out in Vegas. And also at the Arnold Sports Festival in Columbus, Ohio. I mean, they were on the stage at that. You know, they had kettlebell championships there for, you know, the North America. And then also they had the mace competition there, which is – that's really, incredible. really fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of possibilities in in that aspect, even if it's other leagues that are starting up, you know, that it, it's just to get people exposed. And it's such a friendly competition, too. It, it's really like you can learn five minutes before how to swing a 10 and 2 and get kind of like a, a good enough concept of it to be able to get on the platform and try it without having – you know, ever trained for it with a 10 or a 15 or a 17 or a 12 pound mace and just get up there and try it for five minutes. And, you know, that's cool. It's yeah. It, I think it gets a lot of people more involved in the, in the competitive aspect and, you know, it shows, you know, how much fun athletics still are, even at, you know, older age in life when, you know, maybe that's all we can do is compete in something like that because, you know, of previous in injuries or conditions. Right. So it's, it's kind of a lot of fun, you know, and I'm, I'm really happy to see it growing like it is. And yeah. I'm glad, I'm really happy to be a part of it. Like, you know, like I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if you can tell by my face, but I'm just like tickled over this whole thing. I can't believe <laughs> it's, you know, everything happened like it did. No, yeah, I could totally see it in your face. I mean, just, just inventing this thing. I think we, we, we need to respect you, you know, in this, in this industry and, and what's going on. Because, I mean, I, what you're doing with the mace, I mean, this invention is awesome. You know, you invented something really awesome. And then, like, hearing, hearing the journey and the story right now, there's a lot to it, man. So, high five. Oh, thank you. Big <laughs> high five. But thank you for that. But, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was something I felt like, um, you know, if I could bring, you know, a, a real change to somebody's life. And that kind of like inspired me a little bit more, you know, than just saying, okay, well, I've got to make a living and this is the way I choose to live my life. And, you know, I'm going to struggle through my business and then, you know, make it grow and that whole thing. But just the fact like it, it inspires me so much when somebody sends me an email uh, or gives, gives me a phone call and say, Hey, thanks for making that because, you know, my shoulder moves better now, or I lost that 25 pounds, or, you know, you just inspired me to teach my kids how to do something. And now they're interested in fitness. I, I think that's like the biggest reward, you know, that I could ask for. I'm to the point in my life where, you know, it's nice to have money and I've lived on both ends of the spectrum. I've made a six figure income in my life and enjoyed it and I've also made less than twenty thousand dollars a year busting my butt and I'm content either way but when I see something that I can offer uh, you know where somebody turns around and says hey thanks for you know doing that providing that inspiring me to do this I think that's a bigger reward than actually the paycheck yeah I think I think you found your purpose yeah, it's right. kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, re it really is. It Definitely. really is. Definitely. <laughs> so what, okay, so you're, you teach workshops. So you're, yes, you're, I do. You're, on top of, of owning this, you're also a coach. We can, we can say that, right? Yes. Yes, I am. I, I love to teach. Um, I am of the, you know, to paraphrase, well, to phrase Michelangelo or to quote Michelangelo, ancora imparo, which means I'm always learning. I'm always a student and I try to live by that. Thank you. And, um, you know, I never understood that till I actually started. Well, I actually, I did. Um, I, I was in it all my life. I, I, when I was in the restaurant business, I was training other people to take the position that, you know, they would come in and underneath me and I would teach them how to do things. And it was just basically rope work, you know, but then as I got more and more into cooking and other things and I, I was teaching people actually had to make a living rather than just get a, a little job, you know, to become a, a real cook and to become a real pizza man and things like that. I was realizing I kind of liked teaching people. Um, when I got into construction and when I finally became a crane operator, I, I was taught by somebody, I was very fortunate to be taught by somebody who had a lot of patience. He was a natural born teacher. Um, 
he inspired me a lot because he's a, he's a leg amputee above the knee leg amputee and he was working exactly the same way i was he was carrying tools like me he was climbing like me everything else with that artificial leg and i i really enjoyed learning underneath this guy who he spent his whole he grew up in the crane industry his father owned the crane business and he knew like every in and out every trick and he taught me this and i i was very very fortunate to have a person that taught me that way and i learned from him actually um i'm i think 14 years older than him and i learned from somebody much younger than me uh how to do you know to do my my job my my career and i i i paid attention to the way he he talked to me and trained me and he had a lot a lot of patience and uh let me make mistakes but he corrected them as i was going along and i learned from him and i kind of brought that over with me if i had never met him i wouldn't be able to teach people i don't think the way that i you know as as well as i do now and so all these little facets of life and you know for everyone not just me added up to something you know that make you as a person as an individual right so i had i learned how to teach even better from this from meeting this guy and toiling through that time and now i get to share his teaching style you know believe it or not with the way um i'm teaching people with maces and clubs now uh because I was a senior operator at the crane company I worked for. So I would teach guys that were coming up in the field or I'd go out and watch guys work and, you know, offer my help and my advice on the job while they were training. So, you know, I had that aspect of actually being paid to teach before I became a coach and I learned how to do it. When I was in the restaurants, I had very little patience for people. I've got uh, my my genetic background, I guess, you know, tends me to lean towards the hot headedness. I have a last name that ends in a vowel. So we are known to be hot heads, you know, that's the stereotype. And I, I, I yeah, there's, I, I live all the stereotypes that are equated with that, you know, so it's kind of funny. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm basically like a walking cliche. Um, <laughs> so, so that's, it's, it's kind of funny. And, you know, like, I think you noticed my hands probably haven't stopped moving during this whole yeah, you know, the whole inner, you know, the whole podcast. Yeah, which <laughs> so, is fine. I so, like it. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah, I, I am a coach and I do workshops. I, the recent one I did was for Kips with, with Tyler uh, mm-hmm. in Miami at uh, Lion Strong Fitness. Lion Strong has a, uh, that's Lionel Lumark's gym and he's in, um, he's in Miami and he has a big gym down there. It's a beautiful place to do um uh, workshops at, especially for the clubs and mesas because he has a ton of adx gear he really does wow. i mean he's got i think he's got 15 mesas and nine of the arcs and uh 12 clubs right now so he teaches classes like that um i've also taught a lot of workshops at frank de mayo's cave gym over in sarasota mm-hmm. florida and frank frank is actually the founder of macefit.com and it's a mace and club programming system. So basically, if you have maces and clubs, he goes right from the very beginning how to teach your clients. It's the it's the education of bringing of bringing mason club training to the classroom. Frank actually mm-hmm. came up with this genius idea. I mean, you know, before that we were certifying people, and you know, it really you know some people would get into it, but a lot of people had the certification, and they weren't they had to build their own programming now. Right. And it was getting very, very, um, I guess it was a lot of, lot of time taken up for, um, you know, some of the trainers that they had to come up with an actual workout and, you know, based on something to end up with, you know, to get to an end result, to a goal. Frank took all of the f- past, I think, four years of his implementing the clubs and maces in his class and condensed it all into one thing so all you got to do is go on there and here's the workout of the day and you've got it you know you you, it's all right there so if anybody's interested in getting their you know the classes out to people and you know offering it at their gyms or their fitness studios or 
wherever they wherever they coach at, they can check out Frank's um, MaceFit.com. It's got all the programming in there. You can go to a certification for that, which you have to have prior Mace and club experience before you go there. He does not recommend you come in green. So take somebody's, you know, certification prior to that. Yeah. You know, make sure you have a valid CPR card and all that too to be a good trainer, and then check out Frank's programming system because it's really cool and you know his certification is to make sure that you're up to par to be able to teach what he's teaching you know what he's right. offering yeah and it makes, makes sense. sense it keeps the, yeah it keeps the people keeps the people safe and you know it keeps the right people in the right programming it's it's, so in, that, it's interesting that you said that uh he mixed clubs with uh, with the steel mace, and they're kind of complementing each other, right? Uh, yes. I just I just got done, and it's not out yet, but I just got done doing a podcast with Coach Vaughn. He's also on YouTube. And, yes, uh, yes, I I know yeah. that guy. Yeah. And so he was talking about kettlebells and steel maces. So I love how all yep. these guys are just program like creating these programs and and uh, like taking two things and complementing one another in one way well, or form. So that's cool. What I had, what, how I started working back and forth between the mace and the club, I obviously had clubs, you know, we, we discussed that before. So I always had clubs around before I had the maces around. So when I made my first batch of maces, I tried to keep one for myself because sometimes as I was going through the, the, um, you know, like selling all, you know, what I, what I produced to be, um, sold, what, you know, in those batches, um, I would end up selling my own equipment and, you know, I, I always try to, I, I, I have one club that I will never sell because it's the prototype of the AdX club. Yeah, and for yeah. anybody who watches my training, that's the one I, I use in, in most of my videos. And yeah, people ask me if it was lighter because some people noticed it was just a little shorter and I didn't have the right uh, measurements to get the weights down yet, but I, it's a 23 pound club instead of a 25 pound club when it's loaded. But so it's awesome. a couple pounds off. So people notice that. But um, when I did the first batch of maces, I, I, I said, this one is mine. I said to my wife, this one's mine. And I said, I, I'm not going to sell it. Well, I sold out the first batch and it was going to be about three months before I made the next one. It was at a time when the batches were all staggered out over the year yeah. and people would wait months, two, three months to get like one of my products. They pay for it. And they said, I really want one. Here's my money. Take my money. Just send it to me when it comes out. And I was like, wow, that, you know, you're trusting me with, you know, $250. Um, yeah. so that's kind of cool. But, um, sometimes I wouldn't have a mace. And I started realizing that other people, if they wanted to compete with the mace, they might only have a club and they can't afford a mace at the time or they didn't have access to one for whatever reason. And I started showing them how to train with the club to be able to do the mace competition. So it was always a little bit more overloaded with what weight you were going to use with the club, but doing similar movements and the accessory moves that I teach with it. And I had actually had people that never swung a mace before enter a mace competition just by training with the club wow. and they would practice their mace by swinging a broom or a shovel. Wow. 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 And yeah, so, there's, and so there's something going on there. Like, um, and I have noticed that, that there's this, uh, this, there's similarities and differences between the still mace and, and the clubs. Now, can you go into that a little bit? Like, yeah, the clubs, the clubs are more versatile because you can hold them closer into the body and you can swing them lower a lot easier than the mace. You know, a lot of times when people are newbies, they clip the ground a lot with their mace. Even with the club, like doing a front swing, like the same as like a kettlebell front swing. A lot of people, when they have more than 15 pounds on my adjustable club, which will raise it another uh, – That'll be like five inches longer on the club with the with the extra ten pounds in there to go to twenty five pounds. Yeah. You'll see them clip the ground. They have to learn where the ground is. With the mace, it's more difficult. So if you're doing, and also too, you have if you're choked way up halfway up the handle of the mace and holding it like a club, you have that extra, you know, two feet of handle yeah. that's you know getting it, uh, caught yeah. under your shirt sleeve and whatever. Um, the clubs are more versatile in that you can do more exercises with it. The maces, I'm not going to say are more fun, but I think they're more fun. 
you know, just for me. I, you, I, I, you know, I like the mace because, you know, it's, it's like, all right, I can swing that with a club. Let me try it with the mace now. And it's, you know, a completely different feel. And the feel of that is actually what inspired me to make the arc off of a tip from Chris Gilbert uh, at C1 Fit. He said, what if you did like a mid-length handle? And he says, bridge the gap between the mace and the club so people can, you know, start with that and then go to which direction they wanted to go to. Right. So the arc is a little more versatile. As you get shorter, it's a little more versatile. But the torque aspect of the mace, you know, a 25 pounds on a mace, swinging that around in a 360 versus 25 pounds with two-handed halos in a club or two-handed um, shield cast is, is a big difference. Because, right. you know, the torque aspect is, is you know, it's, ex, ex, what is it, ex, exponent, ex, I'm not even going to try the word, <laughs> it, okay. expounded, it's, it's, it's amplified more, okay. and, uh, you know, with the longer handle, so yeah. it's, and it's also more barbaric feeling, it really is, you know, yeah. you know so that in that aspect, it's really cool. All right. Um, well, um. Okay, so let's just ask these last couple questions because we're going to, we're going in pretty long. But um, so you're a coach uh, for someone who's just getting into steel mace, or even someone who's been steel macing for a while. Um, what type of tips can you give them um, when it comes to like steel mace or steel macing? <laughs> steel macing. Um, don't don't fool yourself. This is the biggest problem people have. They always buy a mace or a club that's too heavy for them. And that was one of the reasons why another reason of the Adex club is that you can change it from three and a half pounds to 25 pounds or the mace from six and a, I think six and a half or six pounds to 30 pounds. And you've got 10 settings on each. And a lot of people look and they go, Oh, I can handle a 20 pound dumbbell. Like it's nothing. So let me get a 20 pound mace. And then they realize they're way you know, like, they're like, wow, I can't do this. Yeah. Um, I've met a lot of people that said, yeah, I bought this 20 or 25 pound mace thinking that 25 pounds is light. And I really got my eyes open and now, now I can't use it. And it sucks because it's, it sits in the corner and it's kind of like, you know, just a heavy paperweight. Um, that is a hard, uh, you know, like that in and of itself, start light and learn how to use it and learn what the dynamics of it feels like. This is a modality that you can do for the rest of your life. It's not, you know, uh, something that you have to be really young to do or, you know, started at a young age to continue. This is something we can do until our, if you're, you know, un until your last day, if you're, you know, walking upright. Um, I don't see why it's, you know, why it can't be. So that, and also be patient. Because like I tell everyone, it's a, I stole this from the game Othello when they used to advertise it on TV. It takes a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. So I'm sure with your training, you found a lot of times that, you know, you look good doing reps, but then all of a sudden when you hit on that one perfect rep, your body knows it. Like it just smiles mm -hmm. all over. Mm -hmm. So we're always in quest of that perfect rep. And that's part of the training, just to be patient with yourself and to learn the redundancy of it and go through all of the, the exercises and grow with it and learn from it. And, you know, your swing today, if you're, if you're just starting out is going to be different from your swing a year from now. And it's going to be different from your swing five years from now. Now it's okay. Gabe, you can walk through. Here's one, <laughs> one of the kids that lives down the street. He, he trains at the CrossFit box I coach at. How are you Gabe? And he's cuts through my backyard every day. He's, he's a good guy. He's, he's, a, he's a, a CrossFitter, so he's a cool kid. Him and his family train with us. But um, That's awesome. It is, and he's on his way home from school. Um, so, you know, with that, with that, like I said, back to, back to that, you know, your swing is always going to improve and just practice and have patience with yourself. And if it looks and feels terrible in the beginning, just make sure you're doing it safely. You keep proper shoulder pack by pushing your shoulder blades downward towards your rear, you know, your rear pockets and, you know, maintain that structure and, 
and let your body feel it. When you're doing mason and club training, especially for beginners, you're going to be very rigid. Grow with it. You know, make it make it so that you feel it in your feet when you're done. You know, while you're while you're training, your feet are moving a little bit. And then as you progress and you get more specialized, you can tighten up that form and just isolate it to your arms, isolate it to your arms and torso, isolate it to your arms, torso, and and you know your core area down to your knees, and then let your whole body go with it and work in and out of those those areas and i think i think it's just such an exciting modality to train in yeah because it's 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 you know you're constantly improving it really is no matter how good you get at it there's always that much more room for improvement oh yeah and 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 to change it up and you know i'm sure you've experienced that Oh, yeah. I used to be scared shitless of uh, the 360s and lately, and it took me a while. It took me a while and uh, lately I've been getting better at it, but it took me a long time. I've been macing for probably like two years going in three. Uh -huh. So it just shows you how much patience you need when you get into uh, using the steel mace. Oh, yeah. This is this is really like this is if 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 you're listening right now and you're not into it, dabble in it go somewhere and find out about it you know seek out the trainers that are your in your area you know and there's there's a lot of people that are doing this and yeah. and, and you can find a lot of videos i've got 155 videos on my adx club channel some of them are repeats and some of them you know aren't instructionals it's me talking about different things but you could check out a lot of things there uh, other people like like I said, you know, like uh, if you want to get professional training, you know, look into KIPS, look into the various, um, you know, Mason Club certifications, you know, and, and don't just stay with one tool. Learn how to use them all because they mm -hmm. all work together. And it's, it's so much fun. And now with the advent of the flow coming up, you know, where you see yep. guys like Leo, your kid is out doing a flow and your flow, your steel mace warrior. Um, you know, people are, are really enjoying that and they're doing this in lieu of, you know, walking on a treadmill for when my daughter's a competitive bodybuilder. Dad, I'm walking on the treadmill again. I'm walking for an hour and a half or yeah. she's running five miles on the beach two times a day to get cut up. She's, you know, incorporated club training in there. She likes to do her running on the beach because she gets the sun. But at night now she stopped her running on the beach and she's doing club training, you know, like nonstop you know, flow and club training, you know, with the, with the clubs to, uh, you know, get her cardio up and she's doing that. So you know, there's different aspects mm -hmm. where you can incorporate it into your training and the restorative benefits are just phenomenal. So if you want to add it to your other athletic training or your other performance training, you know, stick it in for five minutes at the end, just do one exercise and loosen yourself up with it. Tons of exercises on YouTube and, you mm -hmm. know, it's just a little common sense to stay safe with it. Don't beat yourself in the face with it. It's not going to rip your shoulder out. You know, like, yeah. like you were, you know, everyone thinks that they're going to rip their shoulders yeah. out when they swing this. Yeah. You're not. And if you don't have access to one and you have a shovel or a, a hefty broom around the house, try it with that first, you know, try to get the patterns down with that and learn how to make the, the, the clubs and the mace swing, you know, learn how to use these tools the the broom and the shovel to swing by itself and take advantage of the the ballistic motion because it actually comes alive it's not like a weight where you're grinding up and you're controlling it down you can actually let that free swing and catch it at you know and develop timing in your body much like the olympic weightlifters do when they're snatching or they're cleaning right so you know get those ballistics involved in it and take advantage of them because they really help your joints even in your thoracic spine, my thoracic spine has gained so much mobility from being locked up of working this way my whole life. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, you know, I, I don't have to, it, even my neck, you know, I can rotate my neck. And, and a lot of people go, well, you exercise this, that, and the other thing. You see people in their cars, they can't rotate their necks to look out their mirrors. Right. You know, so I, I mean, th yeah, because we stop moving and this, yeah. this is all helpful in that area. So, yeah, that just pick it up and start using it. Add it in everywhere, no matter, you know, triathlete, runner, bike rider, pick these tools up. You're not going to put on all that bulk that you don't want to carry around and race with. And it's going to keep you really freaking strong. It does. That's awesome. Now, last question. What is Don's favorite steel mace exercise move? 
Okay, my favorite mace exercise move is got to be the 360. And the reason why I just like to load it up and and go crazy with it because you don't re once you get it down pat, you don't really have to think about it. It becomes very rope. So my challenge with that, where I'm doing that with, is that I try to. You know, I try to do overload training with it, and I've broken it up into different sections. And you can see that on my YouTube channel. There's four um, mace uh, progressions that I have. And I will actually train with 50 pounds doing that. And I'm a body weight of 175 today. Uh, I will use a 50-pound mace on doing some of those progressions. And so, like, I'm really hot on doing that. It's kind of like my bench press in that in that area. I want to see, you know, how much weight I could swing um, a 360 with. And it's a lot more fun to do than a 10 and 2 because 10 and 2, you got to put the brakes on. It's a harder, it's a harder move to do. So get your 360 in first and then work on building your 10 to 2. And with the 360, you're able to do those heavier weights, you know, just constantly moving and it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. All right. So that was Don's favorite move. It was a 360. Yes, it is. And I'll make sure to uh, add all, the, you know, everything that you mentioned, I'll make sure to add the links and, uh, you know, so for Mace Fit and for ADEX and um, your YouTube and stuff like that so people can check you out. And um, thank you so much. Like, thank you again for saying yes, for being in the podcast. I know people are going to freaking enjoy this. Um, I know they're going to learn a lot. I think this is probably like I, I I guess I shouldn't say this live, but I mean, it's one of the best ones. I, I you just you gave so man. much knowledge. You poured yourself out, man. Um, yeah. So I thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I, thank you for having me on and, you know, allowing me to rant about my product and, you know, how I started on this and, you know, what an awesome guy I am and all that other stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I yeah. get to toot my own horn. But um, no, this this was really enjoyable, and thank you for having me on, Victoria. It was it was great. I I hope you asked me to be back on again. Yes, definitely. And like I always tell every guest, may the universe always flow with you, Don. Oh, thank you very much, and stay swinging, my friends. <laughs> thank you.